So what we spoke about was how to actually derive an IS curve, what is going on. And we saw that if we had started with an aggregate expenditure model, if we have some interest rate and equilibrium in our aggregate expenditure model, so if we have an, equi uh, an interest rate of say 6%, and equilibrium in our goods market happens to be at a value of 1,300. You can see that okay, eh? Is it 1,000? Sorry, 1,100. Make it look darker. <coughs> so if we have a 6% interest rate and output of 1,100, we would have some equilibrium point if we were to plot on a set of axes, output versus interest rate. <coughs> then what happens is if we were to lower the interest rate from 6%, what would happen? We found that with a lower interest rate that stimulates investment and increase in investment shifts, shifts our aggregate expenditure curve upwards, which means at a lower interest rate, let's say 5%, if our aggregate expenditure is shifted from A, aggregate expenditure, from aggregate expenditure A to aggregate expenditure B, we move from an equilibrium point A to equilibrium point B, which means we move from real GDP of 1,100 to real GDP of 1,300. In other words, with a lower interest rate, we get a higher level of equilibrium output in the case model. And so we were able to derive from that relationship. That's great. What about the money market? Well, we saw that in the money market, the same thing, you can apply the same sort of process to, to derive uh, the nature of the relationship between output and interest rates in the money market. And what we saw that is that with some level of output, call it 1,100, we have some money demand curve, call it MD0. And with MD0 in our money market, we would have an equilibrium interest rate of, let's say, 4%. So in other words, at our real GDP level of 1,100, we get some interest rate level of 4%. We have a point D. What then happens is, if we increase output from, say, 1,100 to 1,300, what happens? That increase in real output generates an increase in real money demand. That increase in real money demand shifts the money uh, demand curve, and we get a, a new point of equilibrium at a higher interest rate. So, say that the interest rate goes from 4% to 5%. What happens then is, as we increase output, we see that equilibrium interest rate increases in our money market. And so, you can see we have an upward sloping LM curve, which gives us all the points of equilibrium in the money market. Okay. So, that was the right curve. Obviously, deriving the curves and shifting those curves are different stories. So, what we saw when we were deriving the highest curve was if we change the interest rate and that causes aggregate expendi expenditure to shift, we get a downward sloping relationship. If, however, and this is something that caused confusion after the test, people were coming to me asking what on earth is going on. So I know we obviously didn't get it 100%. If we shift that aggregate expenditure curve, but it's not because we changed the interest rate, right? In other words, if we were to shift aggregate expenditure upwards, but interest rates, that shift is not because we changed the interest rates. We are no longer looking at a relationship between the change in output because of a change in interest rate, right? We're no longer looking at that downward sloping derivation of an IS curve. Because when we have that downward sloping IS curve because of the, the shift in the aggregate expenditure curve was caused by a change in interest rate. So we change one of the variables, what happens to the other variable, we get a, an inverse relationship. If, however, we shift aggregate expenditure not because we're changing interest rates, what do we end up with? We end up with if, uh, if we were plotting it on the same set of dots, um, axes, right? If we had aggregate expenditure A and we had some equilibrium point A because interest rate was 6%. If interest rates don't change, right? But aggregate expenditure increases, our equilibrium point would no longer be at point A, correct? Our equilibrium point would now be at some higher point. You happy with that? In other words, at some higher level of real GDP, correct? Which means at this 
interest rate six percent, our equilibrium level of output would no longer be one thousand one hundred. It would be somewhere to the right. Are you happy with that? And the same would go in this. If we shift over to this side here, the same would happen here. At that equilibrium interest rate of five percent, our, our equilibrium uh, level of GDP would now be somewhere to the right. You happy with that? In other words, all the points of our IS curve would now be somewhere on the right. You happy with that? In other words, our IS curve would have shifted to the right. So if there was an increase in aggregate expenditure, not due to a change in interest rate, that shifts the IS curve to the right. You happy with that? So if we have an increase in government spending, what does that do to the aggregate expenditure curve? It shifts it up. Yeah? And if it shifts it up, is that a movement along the IS curve or is that a change, a shift in the IS curve? It's a shift in the IS curve. Why? Because that change in government spending had nothing to do with a change in interest rates. Right? Everyone following me on that one? Everyone happy with the IS curve? The difference between deriving it and moving it. Okay? Now we go to the LM curve and the controversy regarding what Blanchard said versus what I said. Now what ultimately is happening, and I'll explain it to you when we get there, is we're saying the same thing, although it doesn't immediately look like it, and I'll show you why we're saying it. I think, Blanch, I think my way is a better way of looking at it, but it's up to you. You can, you can take either way. You're happy with how we derive the money demand curve? I mean, sorry, not the money demand, the LM curve. You're happy that we derive it from different points of equilibrium in our money market. You're happy with that, right? In other words, at some level of output, we have some equilibrium interest rate. Okay? And so we derive an LM curve. Okay, everyone's happy with that? Now, the point is, what happens, well, how do you shift an LM curve? So we'll talk about what Blanchard says first, and then we can talk about what I say thereafter. So Blanchard, and, and again, we're saying the same thing, so let's just follow what he said. So Blanchard's point was the following. If we have, if we shift the money supply curve, right? When you shift money supply curve, you shift the LM curve, okay? How does that happen? If we had some equilibrium, if we had some level, sorry, of real output, 1,100, given this money market, we're happy that the, the interest rate of equilibrium would be 4%. You happy with that? Okay. If we increase the money supply, right? So we shifted money supply to the right. We haven't changed money demand. Are you happy that the equilibrium interest rate would be lower? Yes. Okay. In other words, this point D for some level of GDP 1,100, we now have a lower interest rate, which is to say, down here somewhere. The bottom, right? Below. Okay? Are you happy if we extend that argument? Sorry, I keep on doing the wrong thing here. If we extend that argument, what we would have is an LM curve that lies below our initial LM curve when we shift the money supply. Everyone happy with that idea? Right? Not happy with that. Yeah, let's just go back one step. Are you happy with this equilibrium point here, D? If I increase the money supply, are you happy that this interest rate of equilibrium, this equilibrium interest rate, sorry, would be at some lower interest rates if I shifted this money supply to the right? You happy with that? This point D, then, are you happy that this point D, if I shifted the money supply curve, should come to some point below here? Are you happy with that? So point D should be lower if I change the money supply, if I shift money supply to the right. So the same would happen at point E. Are you happy with that? That the equilibrium point would be somewhere lower by the same argument, right? And so at any point, D, E, F, we would have lower points of equilibrium. In other words, our LM curve would lie below the current LM curve now if we change the money supply, if we increase the money supply. Of course, if we decrease money supply, the LM curve would then be above. You happy with that? Everyone following so far? Okay, great. So 
let's do some drawing and uh, I think, I think um, one of the things that that confused people which is what I'm going to deal with now is in our last, in that last question in the text, it said right given the fact that when the uh, Reserve Bank increased the money supply, we saw a small change in output. What does that imply about the money demand curve? A bunch of people got confused. Said, hang on a minute. I don't understand why that means elastic demand. Okay? And I think the reason for people getting confused is what I'm going to discuss now. So if not, I'm not sure. You'll have to come talk to me about it again. So, if we've got a money market, and we've got an ISA, uh, sorry, so we've got a money market M, and interest rates are, and then we've got an ISLM where we're plotting output. We have some generic level of output, so this is money demand given some level of output Y0, and some level of output Y0. We have some equilibrium interest rate R0 corresponding to some point R0. We have an upward sloping LN curve as we increase upward. Now, depending on the slope of this money demand curve, we will influence the slope of this LM curve. Okay? We've discussed this a number of times. So the one thing is the following. If I've got a money demand curve that has this I'm going to call it a relatively elastic slope, and then I'm going to draw another curve with a relatively inelastic slope. Are you happy that both of these money demand curves correspond to this point here? Right? What I'm then going to do I'm going to look at two different levels of output. So I've got some level of output, Y1, okay? And given our relatively elastic money demand curve, when I increase Y1, I increase money demand. You happy with that? And that increase in money demand has given a new point of equilibrium interest rate, R1. And so we have our LM curve that is, in this instance, going to be relatively elastic. If, however, so what I've done here, let me just point this out, is I've shifted my money demand curve by some <coughs> real amount of an increase in money. There was this increase in the quantity of money demanded. It is a real quantity of money demanded because there's been a, a real increase in output. There is more goods available so people need more money in order to buy more goods right either that or the velocity of money must change okay if we're assuming that the velocity of money is constant then the only way we can exchange more goods is by having more money right so i've shifted it by some amount whether I shift my relatively elastic curve or I shift my relatively inelastic curve, I have to shift my money demand curve by the same amount. Okay? So now I've got MDY0 for a relatively inelastic demand curve. And guess what's going to happen to my interest rate? My equilibrium interest rate is going to be somewhere up here, right? In other words, for the same level of Y1, I've now got an equilibrium interest rates up here somewhere. You happy with that? And so, if I draw this LM curve, I see the more inelastic my money demand curve, the more inelastic my LM curve. Everyone's happy with that? Fantastic. So now what happens if I shift money supply? Okay. Um, yeah, okay. Is 
If this gets too messy, we might have to redraw it. If we have to redraw it, it's fine. You can take a bit, of, a bit of a while as long as we all get this correct. First, I'm going to draw a relatively elastic demand curve. I mean, money demand curve. But I'm going to make it quite elastic. And we've got some level of equilibrium. Now, I get some new level of output, Y1. And what Y1 is going to do is going to shift my money demand curve by some amount. Okay? What I'm going to draw underneath this is the money demand curve, uh, the same, sorry, money supply curve. Okay? Uh, except I'm going to have a relatively inelastic money demand curve. And we're going to have another ISLM next to it. We've got the same levels of output. Y0. And we have some new level of output, Y1. Okay? At Y1, I must shift my money demand curve by the same amount. Okay? In other words, this distance is the same, okay? Whether we're uh, in the, the economy with a, an elastic money demand or whether we're in the economy with the inelastic money demand. The change in money demand, the shift in money demand is the same as the change in output, okay? Now what we know from these two money demand curves is the following, number one, in this particular in markets, the change in interest rate is going to be small. Okay? So with the elastic money demand curve, the change in interest rate is small. With the inelastic demand curve, the change in interest rates is, sorry, I don't know why did that little dinky at the end. Okay. So we've got two difference, Allen curves, one that's flat, one that's steep. Now, <coughs> ignore for a moment the fact that there are two different money demand curves, okay? Go back to money demand at Y0 and money demand at Y0 in both markets, okay? What we know from Blanchard is the following. If I change my money supply, I'm going to shift my, if I increase my money supply, I'm going to shift my Allen curve down. Okay? What's the point made by Blanchard? Right? What I'm going to show you is shifting it down and shifting it to the right. right? Conceptually are the same as long as you do it in a very specific way. And a specific way of doing it, in my mind, is a better way of doing it if you know what you're doing because it helps you understand better what's going on. Okay? And I'll explain what I mean in a moment. So, if we're going to change the money supply curve, we must shift it by the same amount in both markets. Okay? In order for us to make a comparison between two markets, we must shift the money supply by, some, by the same amount. Okay? <coughs> Are you happy that in, in Blanchard's model, when we change the money supply, if we have an elastic money demand curve, right, for this shift in money supply, for the same level of output, the interest rate changes only by a little bit. Are you happy with that? In other words, when we shift the money supply by some amount, we shift this Allen curve only by a little bit when money demand is flat, okay? In other words, we shift it down only by a little bit. But, when the money demand curve is relatively inelastic, when we change that money supply, what's going to happen to our interest rate? And I had to, to 
change the slope of my curve slightly there just to make it fit. What happens to the interest rate? It changes by a lot, right? In other words, when we shift the money supply curve by the same amount in both markets, in other words, we change, sorry, when we change money supply by the same amount in both markets, the shift downwards of the Allen curve is different. You get that? You got that? Except, and this is why I don't like doing it this way, that shift downwards is in fact the same shift sideways. Shifting sideways by the same amount, although you are not shifting downwards by the same amount. Let me, tell you, let me explain to you why. Remember, if we've shifted our money supply curve by the same amount here, right? That's like saying this point, uh, sorry, at our MD, which I have not, as I said, this, I did say this might get messy, so I apologize if it doesn't look immediately art gallery worthy, right? When I shifted my money supply curve, I shifted it by the same amount as what I initially shifted the money demand curve when we first arrived at the LM curves. And that was on purpose. Because that shift in money supply now brings us to this point on our new MDY1 curves, right? But with the new money supply. Which is to say, it's the same as saying, if I kept my interest rate constant, what level of output would I now be at? Same, if I kept my interest rate constant, what level of output would I now be at? In other words, the shift in the LM curve sideways is the same amount. You, you see what I'm saying? Okay? So, Blanchard, the way that he does it is correct. The theory of it is correct. When you shift the LM curve, you shift it down. Right? The problem with shifting it down is how far down do you shift it? Right? Or you've got to have your money markets and you must move uh, on, a, on an elastic money demand curve. The interest rate change is small, so you shift the LM only a little bit. But when it's steep, you shift that LM down a lot. <coughs> Whereas if you move them sideways, which is technically not correct in terms of what the theory underlying it is, the theory is you would keep the interest rate constant and you change the output. Sorry. You keep the output constant and you change the interest rate. The way I'm looking at it is the inverse way which is say keep the interest rate constant and shift the output and you shift the output by the same amount then we see that in fact for the same sideways shift we get two different changes in interest rates now I think what people might have done in the test which might have got people confused is the following I have some ISLM okay and I know that when I changed my LM I had some change in output, okay? But, depending on whether I have a steep I, um, LM curve, right? Or whether I have a, a flat LM curve, if I shift my IS curve and my LM curve down by the same amount, right? My change in output, well, let's do it, so, uh, in other words, so there's my inelastic LM shifting, and um, here's my elastic LM shifting. Okay, I've got a very small change in output when it's inelastic, and a very large change in output when it's elastic, which is the opposite of what you get if you don't shift them down by the same amount, and that's the point. Because when you change money supply, you don't shift LM down by the same amount, you shift it sideways by the same amount. Okay? So if you have a monetary policy action, a change in money supply, right? Where is the change in output the smallest when you've got an elastic LM curve? Not an elastic LM curve looking at it like that, shifting the LM curve down by the same amount. I think, like I said, because people are getting confused, that's the only way I can, I can imagine that people were confused about it, because otherwise it's very straightforward. The more elastic your LM curve, okay, 
the more elastic your LM curve, when you change your money supply, the smaller the change in output. Let's add an IS curve into this. We were initially here, we moved to here. We add the same IS curve, we were initially here, we are now here. Change in output, change in output. Where is the change in output smallest? When we have an elastic LM curve, which is confusing if you shift an elastic LM curve down by the same amount as an inelastic LM curve. Um, here it appears as though the change in output was very small versus an elastic one where it appears to be very big, but that's because you're not doing it right. <laughs> yeah? So is the solution just to move it sideways, not to move it down? Do we just... <laughs> so, remember, correct is, moving it down is correct. But what I'm saying is don't then get that confused by the idea that you're moving it down by the same amount like when you do with your IS curve. If you want to move it by the same amount like you do in the IS curve, then you've got to move it sideways by the same amount. If you're going to move it down, then you have to... You have to be able to draw your diagrams in such a way that you can clearly see that this shift, right, for the money supply, results in a much smaller change in output than this shift. The easier way to do that is to do it on one set of axes for me is to say, right, if I've got an IS curve and I've got a flat LM curve and I've got a steep LM curve, now I need to shift them. I don't know how much to shift this one down relative to this one without going to a money market and then doing those money demand curve. Whereas here, what I can do is I can say, right, I'm just going to shift my LM curve by the same amount sideways and now I can see right where was my change in output smaller the change in output was smaller when I had an elastic LM curve which is to say elastic money uh, demand curve right so you can do it however you want to do it what I'm saying is this is the way that I find easy it's the same as what Blanchard is doing. Yeah. Um, what about when the perfectly elastic or perfectly inelastic? Yeah, so those are... Yeah. So, um, the point being, if your money demand curve is perfectly elastic, when you change money supply, what happens to the interest rates? stays the same, which means that your LM curve, which was perfectly elastic, the interest rate doesn't change, so you don't shift it up or down. So it just stays perfectly exactly where it was. If you do it my way, you shift it sideways at the same interest rate, you get exactly the same curve, right? It was flat, and now it's just flat a little bit more that way. It's Yeah, we're talking about changes in money supply though. Remember, when we shift money demand, that's moving to different points on an LM curve. Right? We're talking about money changing money supply at the moment. If you want to know what happens when you have a perfectly elastic money supply curve to change in money demand, the only thing that happens is the interest rate stays the same, right? Interest rate stays the same, and you, you move sideways. So what would happen in Blanchard's model? the curve wouldn't move. What happens in my model? The curve doesn't move. It doesn't make a difference because it's shift in money demand. The shift in money demand is a movement along a curve. The movement along a flat curve is just flat curve. You don't, you're not going up or down in terms of interest rate. The interest rate just stays the same. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When you're shifting them down, you don't shift them down by the same amount. <coughs> if you want to shift them by the same amount, you have to shift them sideways. Because shifting them sideways is keeping the interest rate constant. Shifting them down is keeping output constant. What do you want to keep constant? 
When you change money supply, you're not changing interest rate by the same amount, so you're not shifting it down by the same amount. You're just moving to another point, right, of equilibrium. If you're moving the money supply sideways, what you can then do is say, well, how would that reason out if it was for the same level of output, what would have happened to the interest rate, right? And for the same shift in money supply sideways, it's the same as shifting to the right money demand by some amount as if you had sh changed output by the same amount in both models, right? Well, if we said the effect on the interest rate was small, remember, we, then you kind of go in circular because what we're saying is that the Reserve Bank controls money supply in order to influence interest rates, right? So if you've got two different elasticities of money demand and you're going to have the same interest rate outcome, you want to change your interest rate by some small amount in both markets, what that means is that your money supply action must have been different in both markets. You've got a small change in money supply in the one market and a large change in money supply in the other market. In which case, how do you compare the effects of a small change here with the effects of a large change? You know, the whole question would have to be different. In other words, we would have to phrase it to say, what can we say about the relative changes in money supply? Then you say, well, in the one market, the change was big. In the other market, the change was small. Does that sort of, does this, Maggie, sorry, does that explanation potentially explain what, one of the things that you were not happy with? Yeah, I, I was shifting downwards. By the same amount? Yeah, by the same amount. Yeah. That's the case, yeah. <laughs> and you're happy that, why that, that, that's not what you would do? You're happy that that's not what you would do with it again? Is that correct? Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah. Over this page. This one. If I label this properly, sorry, so we had LM Y0 and um, LM Y0. Now we've got LM Y1, LM Y1. I S Y and R. <laughs> that diagram is basically what I'm what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. Interest rate. So what I'm doing, if we go back, so I'll uh, come back to this diagram in a second. When we changed our money supply, right? Remember when we saw that if we changed money demand, right? We were changing output by some constant amount. When I changed my money supply, I also shifted it to that same point just to make the diagrams easier to see. By changing my money supply, it's another way of changing money supply by the same amount and then shifting it is to say, right, if my interest rate was constant and I changed my money supply, what money demand would bring in equilibrium for that, right? It would be a money demand Y1, right? And the same here, it would be money demand Y1, which is to say the same level of output, keeping my interest rate constant. So I can shift my LM curve by the same amount sideways, which is not the same as shifting it by the same amount. Okay, everyone happy with that? Okay. So, being up to speed on our ISLM means that we can now plot the aggregate demand curve.
So what happens is that when we change the price level, if we are dealing with the real money market, we change the price level and we have a constant fixed amount of nominal money supplied. What does that mean about the real purchasing power of that money supply? The real purchasing power must decrease if prices are going up. Which is to say, therefore, that the real money supply, the supply of money that can purchase real goods, has decreased. The nominal money supply is the same, but the real money supply has decreased. So it's as if, as if we were shifting the money supply curve to the left. Are you happy with that? So in our LM diagram, if I shift the money supply curve to the left, what happens to my LM curve? LM curve shifts to the left. You happy with that? If my LM curve is shifting to the left, what's happening to my equilibrium interest rate? Increasing. What's happening to my equilibrium level of output? Decreasing. Are you happy then that if I increase prices, equilibrium output in terms of the goods market is decreasing? Yeah? So we have a new point of equilibrium whereby our money market is in equilibrium and our goods market is in equilibrium. However, our goods market is now in equilibrium at a lower level of output. There's a lower level of real goods being produced, a lower level of real goods being purchased. Everyone happy with that? In other words, if I would show that as a diagram, you happy that that's what's happening? If I now plot output, in terms of what people are buying, right? Output that people are buying, as the price goes up, we see that the quantity of those goods being exchanged, what people are producing, what people are buying, is decreasing. Yeah? So if I plot a relationship between price and output, I have a downward sloping demand curve. Yeah? Okay. We also see that, in fact, we could potentially plot this aggregate demand curve by shifting IS, and we will come back to that in a moment. So, part three, aggregate demand. So we're going to go back to part three. We were talking about aggregate expenditure because this is the demand side of things. Take a break. Listen to music. Relax a little bit. And then we'll do more. 